So I'd just like to start by thanking Jan and Imagine More for inviting us along today to tell our story. Um, as she said, we're from Western Australia, and I don't know if uh, all of you have been there, but it's a long way from here. Um, I'm sure we weren't, we aren't the people who travelled the furthest to be here, but um, we've now discovered why our, most of our federal politicians don't know where Western Australia is, let alone where Perth is. Um, I also note that John was um, uh, um, uh, said he had some concerns about the time slot that he had before morning tea. And uh, for those who present uh, from time to time, you'll know that this is probably the toughest time slot you'll get because people have had a long morning and have a belly full of food now. And um, so we'll try to keep you uh, awake at least. And if you feel the need for a nap, feel free to do that as well. We were inspired by, I guess, by uh, Sean and Lisa's story this morning, and I think what you'll, you'll see uh, uh, from their story to ours is quite a contrast. Uh, it also um, reinforced for us, I guess, that we should have started a bit earlier in our journey with our family and starting uh, to consider um, uh, creating intentional relationships uh, and roles that uh, added value to not only our son Cameron's life, but to our lives as well, because they're all so intertwined. I guess we, uh, we named this um, presentation, The Answer is Ours to Discover, because in Western Australia, and I don't know what your experience here is, but in Western Australia, um, the uh, bureaucratic approach to people with profound disability, and as you will hear from Anthea soon, uh, a person that has an interesting way of expressing themselves uh, was, was full institutionalisation. So the plan for our son, and in some, in some ways, in some levels for us, was isolation, segregation, congregation, and a wasted life. But we refused to let that happen to our son and to ourselves, so we took the initiative and decided to, that we'd better do something and do it quick. So the way that we do this is a bit of a ta tag team arrangement. Um, uh, Anthea will introduce our family and then she'll talk more specifically about our son Cameron. Um, and I'll talk about uh, life uh, com when we compare the, the children's lives. We have lots of kids that Anthea will, will explain in a minute. And Anthea will also talk a little bit about present centered planning. And I'll talk about uh, Cameron's support team or support crew as we call them. And Anthea will sum it up uh, and let you know what Cameron's up to uh, these days, because this has been a fairly long journey for us. So I will hand you over to Anthea. Can you do a slide? I'm assuming there you go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to firstly introduce you to um, our family. So can you all hear me OK? Is this right? Okay. Um, we're a blended family. We have seven children between us. And uh, this picture really is, is everybody. We have grandchildren as well now. Um, Cameron, as you can see, is the handsome young man right in the middle, um, enjoying a bit of life. Uh, all of our kids um, have a lot to bring to our family. They all have their unique um, personalities. Um, and Cameron is just really one of the bunch. Um, but Cameron today lives a really, truly meaningful life. Um, the person you see there, he's very happy, content. Um, it, it's, it's a far cry from what it was when he was young. So I just wanted to point out the difference is quite enormous. OK, we can move on to the next slide, I think. Yeah. Um, so Cameron uh, these days is happy, he's a proud business owner, he's um, a member of his community and quite well known and um, I guess the contrast being that when he was young, um, he, his, his biggest, um, this is not going well, Disability. <laughs> uh, 
so Cameron, um, his behaviour was really what excluded him from participating in life. So Cameron has a number of challenges in his life um, and I'm just going to point them out to you in a way because I need you to understand how he was then compared to how he is now. So uh, Cameron, as a young child, um, was uh, he's not able to speak. Uh, Cameron needs support uh, for just about everything. So he needs assistance for eating, uh, for getting changed, uh, going out into the community. And he still receives support for those daily um, activities. But as an individual, he's grown. And the issues around his behaviour and him being able to access school and community and life in general because of his behaviour has diminished incredibly since then. Um, so, yeah, in the early years when Cameron was born, um, he's, he was born with an intellectual disability and um, I guess he, we tried to access the regular community options of um, um, going down to the playgroup. We were excluded from that as well. But his life basically was centred around um, things like um, early intervention therapies, many doctors and professionals, uh, lots of therapy, medical appointments and the like. Um, he was treated differently to others and I think, you know, Alistair, who's a bit younger than Cameron, uh, tagged along for all of the appointments and everything. Um, but that was life for us back then. You go for a little bit because I've lost my track. Okay. <laughs> so we just wanted to... Um I guess uh, let you know that uh, life in, in the early days for us was, was difficult. Cameron uh, wasn't able to speak as Anthea said, so he expressed himself, himself through his behaviour. And just as an example, um, just going to school took us three hours to get him ready in the morning. So we had to get up reasonably early to get him dressed and just dressed and, and, and breakfast and so forth took three hours because he simply didn't want to go to school. He ha hated school. Um, he wasn't welcome in his school, uh, so he fought us tooth and nail. And uh, schooling for Cameron and for our family was a challenge, to say the least. It was excruciating. And we couldn't wait for him to leave, unlike most other parents. <laughs> Just to give you a bit of an example also about what uh, Auntie was describing, our other children were, were obviously born. They had, we had congratulations. There was local playgroups. There was child health nurses. There was a safe assumption that, he, that they would go to the local kindergarten. They got invitations from other mums to socialise, etc., etc. Cameron's life was very different in that, obviously, he was born. There was a lot of doctors and nurses and specialists. There was a lot of therapy, and, and as he grew up, everything became therapy. He didn't do anything without um, therapy attached to it. There was actually sympathy. Uh, for, from family and friends that uh, said, oh my God, he's got a, a disability, that, that, isn't that terrible? He was certainly at risk, at huge risk of ex exclusion. He entered something that we called uh, human servicehood. Uh, there was, uh, you know, um, teams of people around Cameron that were from uh, various uh, therapists and medical groups and so forth. And, uh, and there was funding for um, child care and so forth, specialist play groups. Um, SNIS was a program for kids with disabilities in Western Australia to go to daycare. It just went on and on. The possibility of social isolation for not only Cameron but ourselves. And uh, he was directed eventually to special education. And during all this, what we discovered was if we didn't do something pretty quickly, then his life was headed to institutional uh, group homes. He would be alienated, financial insecurity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we needed to make sure that that railway track, as we depicted there, bent back up to a more fulfilling life uh, with people who care, and he could have financial security. So we needed a plan, and we needed a quick because he was two years. This all started and dawned on us, I guess, in some ways, uh, two years before he left school. And we thought, if we don't do something now we're going to be in trouble. One of us is going to have to leave work. And, and not only will Cameron live in probably social and financial poverty, but so will our family. So we needed to do something and do it quickly. So uh, I guess um, we were lucky enough to uh, have been exposed to people like John, who was here this morning, Eddie Bartnick from Western Australia, Michael Kendrick, uh, those sorts of people who had a 
had a recipe almost for us to consider about how we might um, go about changing uh, the future for our son and ourselves. And part of that was um, uh, what, you've, what, you, what people describe as person-centred planning. So we embarked on a person-centred planning process. Do you want to describe that? Okay, so here it is. Um, some of you may have experienced this. Uh, it's basically uh, ensuring that you get a group of people together that, are, uh, that understand Cameron, know who he is, and, will, and have a vision for his life that was very different to the vision that the system had for him. We wanted a, what I think has been described a, a couple of times today as a typical life experience for Cameron. So we used the person-centered planning tool to do that. We gathered some people together and we jotted down all, this, all the gifts and talents and opportunities and so forth that, that, Cameron, uh, that Cameron had. One of the things that we also recognized during this process was that we had to have like-minded people with us. We had spent too much time trying to convince others that Cameron could work and he could have a life outside of institutional care. So it did cost us some relationships as we moved through this process as well. For example, his aunt uh, was one of those people that, that doubted, uh, that said, you know, it's unfair to expect these things of Cameron, that he should go to a group home like all of those people go to, and that he should live that life, and you should leave him alone. And we had to exclude her from this process, and that cost us uh, the friendship with her and we don't see her to this day, unfortunately. But we just didn't, we simply did not have the energy to carry on with people that were doubters. Somebody said this morning, you really have to have believers around you. Nothing is more true than that. We had to have believers around us. And the reason also that we wanted to give you some background about Cameron was uh, to, um, we have presented in the past where people have come up to us and said, well, that's all, all okay for your son, but my son, you know, his behaviour is this and her behaviour is that and so forth. And we just needed you to understand that Cameron did his, express himself in, through his behaviour. He would um, kick, spit, punch, pull your hair. Um, his mother was always uh, covered in bruises. We couldn't answer the telephone. He would go into meltdown for three, four and five hours at a time. So it wasn't easy in those days, there's no doubt. And I guess the education department found it even more difficult for some reason. All the professionals, we were handling it at home, but the professionals couldn't handle it uh, in the education system. So he was excluded from that system, um, uh, so much so that he wasn't allowed to go to just about any, well, he didn't go to any camps or any functions or um, they were, in fact, in one, one school that we tried, that was a private school, they had, we, we went there one day to pick him up and they had him in the janitor's room with a support worker. And that's where he was being educated by himself in the, in the janitor's room. So uh, those experiences taught us that if we didn't do something ourselves, that Cameron's life uh, would turn out to be uh, what I think is quite tragic. We need to also understand him and what his aspirations and goals were and make sure that they were as typical as we could make them, uh, as our other kids were uh, experiencing. So one of the th strategies we used, not unlike some other people this morning described, we got a, uh, in those days, we didn't know anything about um, um, uh, support circles and all that sort of stuff, it didn't kind of exist. But we kind of had a bit of a clue that if we didn't get some people around us that understood what we were going through and understood where we wanted to be, then we couldn't do this alone. It was just too big a task. So what we did was we went out and we found some people uh, to be part of that. And um, this is what we call Cameron Support Crew. And these people are made up of um, some people, some of them are family, so aunts and uncles. Some people are past support workers. We purposely went out to find some young people as well because I'm not as young as I used to be. You'd be surprised to know. And um, we had some older people in the group as well. And we wanted to find people who would view wor the world from Cameron's lenses almost, a young person's lens. So we, we went out and, uh, and found those people. We also thought that um, because of Cameron's, uh, the number of challenges he had and his experience in the education world, which really didn't prepare him for anything, um, we would need somebody, and we thought we, we would have to create something that didn't exist currently in WA. 
because there was no employer that uh, would employ Cameron. There was no obvious skills at the time that we could sell to an employer that would be meaningful to them or meaningful to Cameron. So we thought that we would need to create something that didn't exist. So we got some people who actually were small business owners because we were not. So we knew nothing about small businesses and how to create them. But what we did know is if we were going to create something for Cameron, it would be the same as any other small business in this country. It wouldn't be something different. Okay? Some people call it micro-business and use that sort of language. We don't use that language because quickly people become the others. So language is really, really important. So we decided not to use that sort of language and not to go down that path. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Well, you know, but uh, we decided that we would stick with the typical language and the typical experiences that everybody else had in uh, this country when they were developing small business enterprise. One of the things that we thought we'd better do pretty quickly when we invited people into Cameron's life to make some decisions for him is write down what we called a set of guiding principles, uh, principles that we could uh, test our assumptions about when we were making decisions for his life. And uh, as it turns out, that was a very, very good thing to do right at the beginning because it, it, it doesn't take too much time to deviate from what you originally thought you were going to do uh, with a group of people. So just as an example, um, the guiding principles that we came up with is that Cameron support members, group, group members, are working together because they have a deep desire to assist Cameron to plan his future. And it was remiss of me to tell you why Cameron isn't here today to assist us with this. Clearly, as Anthea said, Cameron is nonverbal, uh, doesn't like big crowds as, as well. He would not be comfortable in a room this big with all these people here. And we're confident that Cameron doesn't mind us uh, relaying his story to you. Cameron's support crew members will work together to action plans developed for Cameron in a timely manner. So we didn't want people who were going to say, oh, yeah, that's all good and fine and sit on their hands and do nothing. We, this was urgent for us. We only had two short years to make sure that we could come up with something that wasn't uh, just meaningful to us, but had to be meaningful to Cameron and meaningful to prospective customers. Um, just going back a step, when we were working through the person set of planning process, um, it was a fantastic day. Everyone signed up to do things. And what we found happened was everything fell back on to me to follow up with everybody to get on and do the things I said they would do. So this whole concept of Cameron Support Crew really was about bringing people together in a, in a meaningful way so that they would engage in this um, and we would all do it as a group. There's another principle coming up, you'll see. Yeah. Yes, it's a good point because um, like m most of the parents in this room would, would have experienced people come up with all sorts of ideas, including service providers and so forth, uh, but you're left holding the bag, basically. You're the one that needs to go and make it all happen. So we wanted people that were motivated enough to actually be part of the, of the doing as well. Uh, Cameron's support crew members believe that he has the capacity to participate in making decisions for his future. Cameron's capacity will be acknowledged, respected and demonstrated in all dealings of the crew. And Cameron comes to, although Cameron can't speak, he can certainly know, uh, let you know how he feels through his behaviour, and he comes to all of these meetings. Now, uh, when I say these meetings, this has been going on for like nine years now, and these people are still together. Okay? All decisions made by Cameron's support crew will demonstrate regard for Cameron's safety, comfort and dignity. The reason that we were, we were um, uh, explicit about these things is because one of the, and I'm, I'll go through it in a minute, let's just carry on. All support services will be customised and individualised for Cameron with a focus on expanding Cameron's personal community and his social connection. So not only were we interested in meaningful employment that was going to give him an income and so forth, but we also were very interested in his, in his other connections, so his social connections uh, and his community connections and, and the way that he was going to give back to the community as well. Okay. All members of Cameron's support crew will conduct their business in the spirit of mutual respect, cooperation and collaboration. So we wanted to lay some ground rules, I guess, for how we were going to work together as well, not just about uh, the outcomes for Cameron. All paid services developed and or contracted for Cameron will be customised and individualised for Cameron and not just based on availability. 
what we were experiencing in our state was just that. Um, it wasn't really customised, although people used those words and individualised, nothing was particularly individualised, it was just who was available on the day, and that's what you got. And we certainly didn't want that for Cameron because um, Cameron is a very shy man as well, and he, and he doesn't respond well uh, to change, a lot of change. It certainly doesn't respond well to somebody knocking on the door saying, let's go out when he doesn't know them, for example, or let's do your personal care, etc. Members of, of Cameron's poor crew will base their decisions about people and or agencies who are engaged to support Cameron on, the, their, on their capacity to demonstrate and prove ability, a proven ability to provide services as identified by the crew. These services will be person-centred. That was about um, uh, people who actually knew what they were doing and had a track record uh, of uh, being able to provide the outcomes we were looking for for Cameron. Because there was a lot of uh, new people in Western Australia starting up and uh, didn't really have a, a track record of, of their work. Uh, people who work with Cameron will not uh, be attached to the setting which the Cameron lives works or recreates. Their primary relationship is with Cameron, okay? So that means that, that he, he was, if he was uh, recreating in a certain place, um, they didn't work for the recreation organisation he was recreating in, they actually worked for us or for him. Uh, that, would, that brought a lot of, about a lot of um, different outcomes for Cameron, that's for sure. So supports created for Cameron will facilitate a typical life experience, including risk-taking, relationship development, being involved in his community and community involvement. And again, that was really important to be uh, explicit about uh, because we did want a typical life. We, didn't, we weren't asking for the lotto life. That was not what we were asking for. We were asking for a typical life, not unlike what was described this morning. This was the most interesting principle we came up with and, and I guess all the other principles set the groundwork for us to consider this one. And this one probably uh, as we've gone around not only Australia but certainly Western Australia and talked to parents about, uh, this one was probably the most controversial principle we came up with. And that is that all Cameron's crew will sit at the table with equal authority in making decisions for Cameron's future. Now, it, as it turned out, this was the most important principle we came up with because people were uh, uh, committed to making sure that the decisions that they made had a significant impact on his future and weren't just sitting there giving suggestions to his parents <coughs> to make a decision about. Um, everybody uh, had uh, the same authority, so everybody's uh, opinions were equal. It wasn't just Anthony and I sitting at the head of the table saying, give us suggestions and we'll make a decision. It had to be um, uh, an equal, pro an equal uh, uh, process. Um, otherwise, people could have said, well, I'll just email you some suggestions because this is lip service. This is not real. I'm not really part of this decision-making process. That was hard for us as well because you know, uh, he was, he's a vulnerable young man and we were just uh, embarking in this pro on this process and we thought, well, um, we're confident that the people that we've got around us won't make uh, inappropriate decisions. And, and it had to be unanimous. When people came up with the young people most, um, most likely came up with the, with, the, um, with the more risky kind of decisions about what he should be doing in his recreation, etc. Uh, but if anybody came up with a suggestion, there had to be a plan around that suggestion anyway and strategies to reduce risk and so forth. Um, but that was one of the most important principles we came up to and we actually st stuck to that principle. So we didn't make all the decisions and we certainly don't now that, now that he's a grown, a grown man. So, uh, and as, as, the, uh, as the decisions were starting to be made, we tested it against all these principles, and I think it held us in good stead to have written them all down. So the other thing about his support crew is we, we needed to make sure that they were not only committed, but we were having fun together. Um, there's nothing worse than coming with an agenda and it's all work, work, work. And uh, So what we did was there was a lot of, um, lot of food, uh, a lot of wine, a lot of fun as well. Uh, we also did a couple of road trips a year. Uh, Cameron's uh, aunt owned a farm down south of, uh, of Perth, 
So we packed everybody on buses and so forth and we went off down south and we had our meetings there and barbecues and so forth. We met regularly um, throughout the year uh, because there was a lot of decisions to be made uh, in a short period of time. Um, and, and like I said, in various uh, venues. Just a quick story about the importance of having this group of people around uh, Cameron. Um, I think we talked, uh, or um, uh, Lisa talked this morning about the importance of leavers when people leave school. Uh, and because Cameron was never uh, allowed to do anything, when it came to leavers, um, they said that he couldn't participate in that either. One of the uh, young women, uh, Emily, in this bottom picture here, she was part of Cameron's support crew and she was absolutely outraged by that. And uh, she went and she worked in a gas and oil company and she went and told her boss this story about this young man that she was working with uh, in his support crew and that the school wouldn't let him go to Leavers. And of course, probably most of us in this room went to Leavers uh, when we were going to school. And it's a rite of passage. It's the next step in life. It's almost, you know, here's the Leavers thing. Now you go on to higher education or adulthood or whatever. But uh, Cameron, uh, Cameron wasn't allowed to do that. So the, her boss said, I will give you a week off paid leave if you go out and make this happen for this young man. And she did. To her credit, she absolutely did. She got some of his friends and some of her friends and some young people together. And off they went down south. And I don't know whether you know anything about Western Australian leavers, but they go down to Dunsborough and places like that. And they cause havoc and so forth, drink a lot and so forth. Um, and they went off and did that together. So Cameron actually did have a leavers. Uh, it wasn't as big as some of the other uh, leavers uh, um, groups, but he had a great time and he uh, spent some time with his friends. I might just add there too. Um, so Cameron, um, in going away with these people, demonstrated to us that he was capable of doing a lot more than we had expected. So, I mean, Cameron's very unstable on his feet and has epilepsies. The venue they chose to take him to was up a number of steps. I mean, and there was glass around. We would always worry because he has a very spontaneous um, reaction when there are loud noises and, you know, it's easy for him to break things. And they went to a restaurant. There's wine glasses and everything. And none of those things happened. You know, we always believed in raising the bar and keeping our expectations high. And these guys just proved through and through that Cam was more than capable of, of behaving and being like everybody else. It's an important point because Cameron, um, not unlike everybody else in some ways, either lives up or down to your expectations. And um, unfortunately, his experience with the education department, they had no expectations of Cameron, none at all. They didn't think that Cameron would be able to do anything, so they didn't bother educating him. Cameron left school with no friends at all, not one. Okay, The only people in his life was us, nobody else. Um, and it took a long time for us to build up that, uh, that, um, that support for him. Yeah. He did leave school with a file about this big and a thousand stories we could write a book with, but we really have glossed over that because it would take a long time <laughs> to tell. They excluded him from everything, including opportunity. An opportunity to form any type of friendship was, was uh, ignored, mostly because they thought Cameron couldn't be a friend to anybody because he would pull your hair or spit at you or kick you or whatever. Um, we've certainly proven them wrong, thankfully. And the way that we did that was um, we thought, well, most of us get friendships and connect, social connection and community connection. A big part of that is work. Um, everybody said Cameron couldn't work. What could he possibly do? He should be at a day centre with th two or three large men like my good self to keep him under control. And this is when our seven-year-old was taking him across to, to the local park playing by himself. But no, the system said no, he would need big at least two, if not three, big men with him all the time uh, to keep him under control. We knew that was not true. But the struggle that we had was, here's you, his life experience, he's now, um, he's now 16, 17 years old. He has little to no recognisable skills, no recognisable relationships. Um, where do you start? But we thought, well, why don't we create a business for him to leave school. So when he leaves school, he goes straight into his own business and he starts work. Um, but what would he do? He didn't have any recognisable skills, so what, what could we possibly do to help him create this business? Thankfully, we had a lot of people in his support crew that were absolutely committed believers. 
And one day we were, well, one day for a period of time, we were doing some major renovations to our home. And when we came to the end of that, we decided to put the foxtail off. This is in the day when it was reasonably new. Um, and when you, I'm sure you've all experienced this, you ring them up and you say, when can you come? And they say, well, be, be, home, be home between 9 and 12 or 12 and 5. And I said, well, you must mean Saturday then. And they said, no, 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 during the week we don't work on Saturdays. And as I was having this conversation with this man, I was looking at Cameron, he was sitting on the lounge and he was waiting for a support worker to come and take him out. And it dawned on me that Cameron had been waiting all his life to get a life because he simply didn't have one. So I took this idea to the support crew and I said, Cameron's really good at waiting. That's his one fantastic skill. He waits all the time for everything. Waits us to get him up in the morning, waits for us to give him breakfast, waits for him to get dressed, waits for him to go to school. He's waiting. So with that small idea, we created a business. And it's a waiting service. And he does it. He's been doing it for nine years now. And the idea was, if you go to Harvey Norman, you have Harvey Norman here, I'm assuming, and you buy your fridge and your colour TV, and they need to deliver it, they will say, just like the, tel the Foxtel guy, they will say, be, be, home, be home between 9 and 12 or 12 and 5. And most people can't do that because they have to work and they don't do it on Saturdays. So Cameron comes and does the waiting for you for a fee. And while he's there, he has a list of things that he can do for you, like clean your car if it's there, get the cobwebs down, clean the driveway, do the edges, stuff like that, sweep the leaves. Uh, all those things that when you come home on weekends you don't want to do yourself because that's leisure time for you. So we've, uh, ten minutes, okay. we've, um, we've created a whole business around that. And like I said, Cameron's been doing this for nine years. And he's been doing it very successfully to the point where he no longer will need his pension soon. And a lot of parents went, <gasps> don't, you know, disability support pension, don't give that up, takes too much time to get back. But I think anybody on welfare of that, of that nature wants to get off. They don't want to spend the rest of their lives on welfare. People want to be valued, want valued roles, and one of them is to be fully employed and self-sufficient financially. And that's certainly what we were striving for for Cameron. And we're about to achieve that. Cameron has contracts for, we also, want, one of the things we did do, that was the subcommittee um, that uh, worked together to um, come uh, to plan for the, for the, um, for the business. One of the things that we did, we, we did first for the support group was we wrote down a whole bunch of principles which we've already gone through. So we thought it was a good idea to do the same thing for when we created the business for Cameron. So we wrote, I don't, don't have time to go through all of these, but we wrote down a number of principles. I, I think I was standing at a forum once and I said in the support crew there was 12 principles, not unlike the 12 commandments. And somebody in the front row said, I think there was only 10. <laughs> There clearly should have been 12. But um, so these are some of the principles, and I, again, won't have time to go through them all. But uh, basically, it was, it was uh, part of a process where we could go back, back again when we were creating this business and test our assumptions against those principles. And it was, inter it was an interesting thing to do because not only did, um, did the business need to be meaningful to Cameron and he needed meaningful in involvement, uh, but it also needed to be meaningful to the outside world because the whole plan was for him to make money. It wasn't about doing voluntary work all the time or it wasn't about, you know, maybe, you know, doing a little bit here and a little bit there. It was about having a real meaningful job, which he has. This is it, CamCan Services. That's his website. So those people here, if there's anybody from Western Australia, please don't hesitate to use CamCan Services. Um, he has had contracts in... In, um, he had a vending machine contract for some time where he would go and um, uh, get the money for the guy that owned all the vending machines and he would replace the coke or the chips or whatever. Um, he, uh, not that he liked gardening all that much, to be honest, and I must admit I don't either, but he quite, he quite enjoyed being amongst the leaves and raking and things like that. He also liked to be on the farm, so sometimes he'd spend some time on the farm gaining some skills. He also... Don't ask me why, but he loves washing cars. Absolutely loves it. Anything with water, Cameron really enjoys. And he particularly enjoys hosing not only the car down, but his support workers and, 
and anybody else in the vicinity particularly likes that, really tickles him, tickles me too, by the way. Um, and he's got a, a significant contract now uh, uh, cleaning a fleet of cars. So he looks after a fleet of cars for a company who provide him with uh, quite a, a reasonable income now, which is fantastic. Um, I, I was just going to add to that. Um, so Cameron, um, over the years, his skills have improved radically. So his attention span has improved. He walks proud. You know, he holds his head high. He used to be slumped over all the time. When he's got his work clothes on, he knows exactly what's happening. He knows where he's going. He's got his kit for car cleaning, whatever it might be. Um, he just knows the way the day is laid out. But one of the keys is having um, a really good match of support people with him, and they are the quality control to the work that he does. So if he's having a day where he's you know, not as focused as he might be some other times, it's their responsibility to ensure the job is done properly. Yeah. And nobody thought Cameron could do this. And to be honest, um, if we, and we are honest people, yeah. trust me, um, he surprised us as well. Um, out, we always thought our expectations were pretty high. But as Cameron, as Cameron got involved with this and he had friendships that were developing, he had people around that were welcoming, um, he had significant relationships forming, his behaviour diminished significantly. And, uh, but his enjoyment, and um, I know that John said goal shouldn't be happiness, but by uh, giving, ensuring that he had all these opportunities, his happiness was clearly expanded as well. And like Anthea said, he would never look you in the eye. He was always hunched over. He used to walk on his feet in his hands. And now he stands up strong and proud. He's a proud business owner and young man. Um, his uh, business, he volunteers at the local yacht club as well, um, which he's been doing for quite a number of years. And he's formed a lot of very strong relationships down there. This is his, um, his business cards and so forth. Uh, your time is my business, clever. Um, he has, uh, the, the business is also created as a small Australian business enterprise like any other. He has a business plan, he has a marketing plan, he has workers' compensation, public liability, he has promotional items, and he also has a coordinator. Because at the time, we were not only his parents, his carers, but we were also his business partners. And we didn't want to continue to do that. It was too, too time consuming. So we decided not to. So he has a coordinator, coordinates all that stuff. We don't do any of that anymore. At the same time as we were doing all this, he had an opportunity to move out of home. And we'll have to skim through this. I'm sorry, we, you know, we're summarizing you know, years of work in 40 minutes and 45 minutes. So it's pretty difficult. He had an opportunity to leave home. Do you want to do this? OK, so he had an opportunity to leave home. We didn't have any resources, we didn't have any funding or anything, so we thought, well, how could we make this happen? We also didn't have much funding for the, to create the to work either, the um, business. So we decided he had an opportunity, he, he, he found a home and we just advertised for somebody to come and live with him. Not somebody with a disability, just a person in the community. We were very lucky to find Tupia, that's the guy down there, who shares with Cameron, we've been together for about nine years now. And uh, Tapir does not do any personal care or anything. Tapir is his housemate, OK? They share their lives together, that's all. Uh, they share meals together, they go out together, they play music together. Tapir um, is a, is a music musician, and Cameron loves music. So um, they hang out together, and often Tapir will say, don't, um, don't bring the support today, because Cameron and I are going to go and watch the footy. So we don't need the support today. They hang out together. Cameron has also established a significant number of relationships that have been enduring for the last eight or nine years now, which is fantastic. Um, we, we, we did in, intentional uh, relationship building because this lady down here, the older lady, lived next door to Cameron, and uh, Irene had a, an issue with her gardening, and the guys had an issue with cooking. Irene loved cooking, and the guys didn't mind gardening. So they swapped, okay? She did all the cooking for them, they did all her gardening which was a fantastic outcome for both of them. Um, the reason that we found out that they, didn't, they weren't very good cooks is that we, um, I don't know whether you, can, you know, but you can um, get the uh, fire alarms attached to your mobile phone. It was one of the strategies for when Cameron was uh, home alone. And of course, it kept going off, so we'd ring to Pierre and say, what's going on? And he said, oh, I'm cooking something and I'm burning it again. So we discovered pretty quickly that he was not a great cook. Um, Cameron has gone on all sorts of trips. That's him playing the drums. He does all sorts of recreational activities as well. 
not unlike everybody else. And he started to travel. We, we didn't know whether we could ever, ever get him in the plane and all that sort of stuff, but the support crew said, no, we're going to do this. So all we did was kept visiting the airport, kept lining him up and then bringing him out and getting the, air, the airline ready, you know, just in case. And he was fantastic. Went to Broome, had a great day, a great uh, week or so, and was, was fine. There was no, no problems at all with Cameron. Um, just to let you know also, because we had nothing else to do, we, we were, um, we were uh, interested in getting uh, a, a, a disability service provider to support Cameron. He got some funding from the Disability Services Commission, now the NDIS, um, and we're having just as much trouble with the NDIS as you guys. You'll be glad to know, and we've only just jumped in in WA. So, but um, we couldn't find a service provider that, that we could trust. It was just as simple as that. We really wanted somebody, an organisation that followed all those principles that we came up with that, that would provide Cameron with a good life. We couldn't find one. So we started one. We started CamCan and Associates about seven years ago now, and we have 300 members uh, that we provide our services to and 500 staff. So um, that's gone along very, very well. So Cameron now, there he is. You want to end it? Finish it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so Cam is still, I mean, getting on with his own life. He has his own business, um, quite independent of Cam Can and Associates. Um, I mean, I think Cam is pretty inspirational. I love looking back at the story, and I'm sorry I got a bit stuck at the beginning, but it's quite emotional. We don't do this a lot, and when we go back and, and look at the photos, it's a journey back in time, and I listen to a lot of your families today speaking and, and people you know, really making an effort to create a good life for their family and their family members. And I must say, it's, it's a ton of work, but it's so worth investing in because the outcomes are amazing. You know, just giving people a chance to be like everybody else, it, else is so worth it. Thanks. Yeah, and just to conclude also, it's, this is not the easiest road to go down. It's easy to hand our sons and daughters over to the system. But the outcomes, are, I think Cameron's a good example of outcomes being significantly different. If you go down this road, Cameron has taught us so much during this process and we have people not unlike the other presenters this morning where they've come up to us over a number of years and said, I can't believe how much Cameron has taught me as a person. Three of the most important components obviously was uh, his, his support crew. It was, um, we never take a work off table for anybody. We have people who have profound disability in WA that we have helped find work or create their own work. Um, through our work with um, Cam Can and Associates and his home life. So it's all, it's, it's everything really. It's not just work, it's not just his home, it's not just about relationships, it's about the whole package. And it is difficult, but the outcome is significantly different, as I said. So thank you for listening. <laughs>